Hello, and welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Good to have everyone today. We have Laurie and Brian and Oscar and Paul and Scotty. Good to have you guys. The 33rd verse of the Tao Te Ching, we will discuss um, any announcements. Go to buddyc.org. Got a lot of good things there for you. Uh, look under the resources. We have some a lot of helps there. We have a daily devotion you can sign up for as well. We also have all of the most, if not all, the books that we uh, reference are in the little bookstore under resources. And I'm just going to leave it there today. We also, oh, I will mention our Facebook group that I don't mention very often. We have a Facebook group by the same name as the um, podcast where we post the video for the podcast. We also post different other memes and suggestions and quotes and things and discuss this not only with other things as well so all related to uh, just being open to where the higher power takes us in this walk because i have found that once i got into recovery and for me that was the 12 steps of alcoholics anonymous once i got into recovery and started surrendering to the process which is what we're told to do surrender to the process when i started becoming aware of these spiritual practices that i knew nothing about i started being attracted to some of those things and so i started just researching and looking and i found some areas of study that really spoke to me and still speak to me that i did not even know existed and one of those is the Tao Te Ching that we're talking about today. This book was written 2,500 years ago. Most of what we talk about is the Tao Te Ching. 81 verses, I think 5,000 words. Most of the woo-woo quotes you hear that are Asian sounding, a lot of those came from the Tao Te Ching. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the 33rd verse and how it relates to our recovery, we make a point. We've all studied this before. I've talked about it before. You can go back in the back episodes and listen to where we've discussed this very verse. But I bet if you go back and listen to that, the discussion today will not be the same. We do not go back and look at those notes. We don't try to figure something out. We try to come to this fresh this morning. I have not looked at it. Actually, we looked up which one we were on right before the meeting so we could pull it up. I haven't even read it yet. So we try to come at the verse from a place of how is it speaking to us now and in our experience. So let's get to it. I'll read the Stephen Mitchell. This is 33rd verse of Tao Te Ching, Stephen Mitchell translation. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. If you realize that you have enough, you're truly rich. If you stay in the center and embrace death with your whole heart, you will endure forever. Any other translations that anyone would care to read? Hey, buddy, I'd like to read the Derek Lynn. Okay. It says, those who understand others are intelligent. Those who understand themselves are enlightened. Those who overcome others have strength. Those who overcome themselves are powerful. Those who know contentment are wealthy. Those who proceed vigorously have willpower. Those who do not lose their base endure. Those who die but do not perish have longevity. I hear that dying to live in that last little stanza. I definitely see the paradoxes in this. Anyone else? Hi, buddy. I'll read the Ralph Allen Dale translation, version 33. If you understand others, you are astute. If you understand yourself, you are insightful. 
If you master others, you're uncommonly, uncommonly forceful. If you master yourself, you have uncommon inner strength. If you know when you have enough, you're wealthy. If you carry your intentions to completion, you are resolute. If you find your roots and nourish them, you will know longevity. If you live a long creative life, you will leave an eternal legacy. Hmm. Long creative life, you will leave an eternal legacy. Okay. Any others? How about the Jonathan Starr? Oscar, anything in that today that you liked? I got read it. Please. Uh, one who knows others is intelligent. One who knows himself is enlightened. One who conquers others is strong. One who conquers himself is all-powerful. One who approaches life with force surely gets something. One who remains content where he is surely gets everything. One who gives himself to his pos one who gives himself to his position surely lives low. One who gives himself to Tao surely lives forever. Yeah, he's got that back and forth there, right? The thing that, yeah, that's good, but this is better, right? Yeah, others, you're intelligent, but if you know yourself, you're enlightened. Yeah, one who conquers others is strong, but one who conquers himself is all powerful. And we know we conquer ourselves by surrender, right? It's surrender that causes the conquering of ourself. We learn that in recovery. The one who approaches life with force surely gets something, but one who remains content where he is surely gets everything. One who gives himself to his position surely lives long, but one who gives himself to Tao surely lives forever. Now, I love that. I love that. Buddy, there's a comment in the Derek Lynn. It says, a noble goal for Tao cultivators is to live a life rich with meaning and full of joy of helping others. Such a life continues on forever in the hearts of people, remembered, cherished, and missed. Mm. To me, that speaks to humility. Yes. Yes. I was looking for the AA quote that the good is the enemy. Is it the good is the enemy of the best? Isn't that an AA quote? Hold on a second. Sure. Try to find that right quick. Ah, uh, here it is. How about this AA quote? This is from the second tradition, 12 and 12, page 138. And what this is about, Bill, in this tradition, had been offered a job. I think, is it Towns Hospital? Got offered a job, and he went in to tell the group. This is when AA was just starting. And he thought this was, he thought he heard from God on the train back to them that that this was the way he was going to be provided for because he was going broke trying to help drunks and his friends challenged this in the group conscious in a little group meeting and they said bill haven't you often said right here in this meeting that sometimes the good is the enemy of the best this is a plain case of it you can't do this thing to us so the good being the enemy of the best and maybe this 33, I'm starting to see some of that, that we have something that's good, but we also have something that is the best. Each of these give that kind of example, I think. Let's start with the first. And I'm going to, being we all have can have it in front of us, the Stephen Mitchell. For you listening on the podcast, there's a link in the episode notes that's um, a page that has all the different translations. So. We can all follow along with the Stephen Mitchell if we'd like. Use it as our uh, base text. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. What's the difference between, what does that bring to your thinking? What's the difference between, I thought my intelligence was my knowing. Is true wisdom not my intelligence? Would the true wisdom be the inner knowing? The knowing that comes from the heart rather than the knowing that comes from my education and my intellectual understanding. 
we were talking about this in a Course in Miracles meeting the other night about intuitive knowing, which would be listening to your heart. And we've all, I'm not talking about something that we haven't all experienced. I think any human has experienced this. That time that you just knew what to do, that didn't come from your that didn't come from your book learning or your intelligence. That came from somewhere deeper than that. I've experienced it quite often. And someone asked, how do you know it's not something you're making up in your head? I said, well, sometimes I don't know. I will follow it as long as it's not bringing harm to anyone or myself. And sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not. But it's amazing the times I've had that inner, maybe I should do this or whatever the case and it turned out to be exactly what i needed to do it takes time to start listening to that and it's almost like when you read something in a book and you learn it you sit and you look at it and you learn it you start to intellectualize it for me the true wisdom comes when when it comes it's as if it's something i already knew that i had remembered and it reminds me of on the matrix on let's see the first movie when neo first sat down in the chair and he told morpheus he said how's all this going he says i know judo he said i know something because of the whole process but it reminds me of that in that it's something he didn't know it's something he didn't learn but it in that case it's sci-fi but that same idea huh i know something that i didn't know before yeah any comments, guys? How do y'all, how does that happen for y'all? Or does it happen for y'all? Oscar? Yeah. For me, I always, I have a lifelong of thinking that being intelligent was one of the most important things in the world. Uh, and it started when I was young and going to school and learn hard and study hard and then becoming an artist. And then I, I you have to be more intelligent. And, Always this hunger for more knowing and the knowing, but the knowing was, but since actually, since I'm serious, seriously started recovery, I go inward. In, I, I, the intelligent, let the intelligence be what it is. It's not so much. And I turn inward and then the more and more I don't know the richer I feel. The field of not knowing and not understanding and just being in it, I really like far much better than the fighting for more knowledge. So the sense that I know myself better because I realize I know nothing is really, yeah, it's really calming. It's really calming. That's my experience, and I and I, it helps me a lot to stay sober, to say, okay, let intelligence be for what it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't say anything. It's not my identity. It's not who I am. I just get, what do I get from it? Irritated and restless, and and impatience and jealous and. All the things come from the striving for intelligence, which is nothing. In the end, there is no measure. It's just facts. It's really nothing, intelligence. In a way, compared to turning inside, oh, this is what life is. Okay. You also come closer to intuition, as you just mentioned. There are so many things I already know. I don't have to make a list pros and cons if I make a decision. It's really nonsense. I already know. The, I just, the, just the real you know. already knows, right, Oscar? The real you. Yeah. Ha have you thought about just like our thoughts and meditation are not us? That's one thing that we learn. So those thoughts are not me. Is all of our intellectual understanding us either? It's, it's nothing. It's it's just uh, uh, another flaw. Yeah. We're what's underneath that. We're that, and, and I just recently realized that. So, wait a minute. All of my 
goals and things I've accomplished. That's not the real me. No, it's not at all. Yeah. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Brian. To me, it speaks to, to there's no substitute for real life experience. You can have all the education in the world and all the book smarts on a subject. That's like the big book. You could sit down and read it and analyze it. And, but it, until you experience powerlessness, until you experience hitting bottom and realizing that shit ain't working, there's no substitution for that. There's no substitution for that. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. This is page 86 out of the big book. In thinking about our day, we may face a decision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision. We relax and take it easy. The opposite of what I want to do, right? We don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we've tried this for a while. What used to be the hunch or the occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Yeah, that's the difference between an intellectual decision and a, a decision that comes from your heart, from your innermost is another way to say that. And sometimes I don't know the difference. I'll just rest and wait and relax until I feel it's the right answer, as long as it doesn't bring harm. And if I say it's not, I take another pause, do the same thing again. Any other comments before we move to that next stanza? Okay. Yes, Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to add to the discussion here. Just uh, you guys pretty much said what I was thinking, but I just go back to. My mind once in a while will just keep flashing back to my moment of surrender um, when I was laying in the hospital. And that's one I can, that I can put my finger on and say that I just abandoned all of my intellectual thinking at that stage because my best thinking got me into that situation. <laughs> I, I always thought I could outsmart my addiction, but I got to that point and thankfully I did where I just realized that, hey, I can't, out, I can't think myself out of this situation anymore. It's just useless to try. And I think that's where I started to know myself a lot better starting that day. And that's really been the, the root and the basis of my recovery. And I really, I'm really starting this whole verse confused me at first, but now as I hear Oscar and Brian and you buddy sharing on the recovery aspect of it, it starts to make a lot more sense. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to have you today, by the way. Glad you could join us. Mastering others is strength. Okay, that's the second best, right? Uh, mastering yourself is true power. And Paul touched on what I think the mastering yourself would be. It's not the same as outwardly mastering others. It's not as if you take the same action, but inward. That's what I used to think. The same way that I would uh, work hard and do better if I had some business thing that wasn't working. Regroup and just put more force toward it, more push, more money, more effort would be, that's the way I approached recovery at first because that's all I knew. I said, okay, let's just work these steps. I just got to try harder and do better and I'll be able to sober. There's no reason I can't stop drinking. Did not work almost killed me. So true power is in mastering yourself, but the way that you master yourself is the rub. And for me, that was exactly what Paul touched on, and that's surrender. The weaker I get, the stronger I become. Now, that's a Bible quote from Paul, Storm in the Flesh, and that's what he realized in Corinthians was that the less he fought, and the weaker he got, the more he realized strength was there for him, not his own. Same thing we see in this. We may not understand it, but when I finally do what Paul said and said, I give up, I cannot do this, all of a sudden it starts lifting. I don't understand it. It wasn't that I had to I had to believe anything particular. It wasn't that I had to have 
earn anything. I just had to let go. And most of us, without having a God that we believe in, most of us can't do that. But I think it's possible to do without a higher power, as we think of that as a God in our life. The way that I see that is if I use my energy toward helping others rather than helping myself, it works. And that craving starts lifting. The great thing about AA is to each his own. We never have a meeting. We all, we always say that you've got to believe in a power greater than yourself. That's part of the AA deal. But we never tell you what it's got to be. There's never a meeting that says, okay, let's go around the room and talk about what our higher power is. What do we believe? The high... You'll never hear, you shouldn't ever hear that as a topic in a meeting. I've heard that one time and the meeting just derailed because everybody, it was like fish stories. Never did that again. So it's interesting how much liberty we're given to figure that out and the way, but the way that we're told to figure it out is always, I believe the same. We're told that we work these steps. We, we start serving in our life, whether we want to or not. We pray for those that we resent all these ways that what we're, what I think we're doing is if God is love, We're getting compassion into our life, and we're starting to live in some form of compassion. And as we do that, we start to change. I think that's how that works. So we really surrender ourselves. That's the true power. That's the mastering is the surrender, is the letting go. Well, that's what I think. Any other comments, guys, before we move to the next one? All good? Okay. If you realize you have enough, You are truly rich. When one remains content where he is, one one who remains content where he is surely gets everything. I realized one day there was nothing that I needed that I did not have. Have y'all realized that yet? There's nothing I need. I I I think that's called gratitude, buddy. It is, Paul. But we can't see it, can we? If we're always grasping for more. That's why I make, that's why I make gratitude a, a conscious practice every morning. You still do your gratitude list? Oh, you know it, buddy. Every day for the last 14 plus years, haven't missed a day. Uh, it works. It does. It does. And we get to this point in recovery. And when it started happening for me was after I worked my fourth and fifth step and got on into my eighth and ninth when I started identifying the fears and identifying the harms I'd committed and started making amends for those things and started being honest. I just, all the stuff we learn as we work through the steps with a sponsor. And I started realizing that all of my wanting was out of fear because I was going afraid I was going to lose something I had or not get something that I wanted, not something I needed. When I say we have all that we We have enough does not mean that we're just barely scratching by. (laughs) You can have that connotation. When I need it, I'll have it. And it's just barely enough. And poor, woe is me. I think it's different from that. For me, it's I have enough is I have, I am complete. I have everything that Buddy needs in this moment. Laura, you have something? Yes. I noticed I stopped seeking. <clears throat> I used to come to meetings like this and study the Tao and I'm, oh, I'm, it's that, what do they call it? FOMO, fear of missing out. That, uh, yeah, I wasn't going to make it. I wasn't going to do the right thing. Right thing. That used to boggle my mind when it brings that up in the good book. You'll just intuitively know the right thing to do. Like, how does that work? I don't know. But when I stopped seeking, it was such a relief. Oh my gosh, there's so much freedom in that. Good grief. I don't need a guru. I don't need a priest. I essentially, if I can tune in to that power inside and pay attention to it, not just tune in and then tune out, <laughs> actually take action then that is my happy place. And this is, 
you know, as usual, the, the verse is perfect for, I just figured out this morning because a lot of people say, well, happy, joyous and free, follow your intuition. How do you know what you said earlier, buddy, about how do you know it's not your imagination as opposed to your intuition? How do you know it's not your insanity or your delusional BS rather than your highest good or for you? So I came up with this great distinction this morning for myself, and that is what I've noticed is I'm proud of myself. What makes me proud of myself? I can eat the pretzels and they feel great in the moment. The almond joy, the candy bar, whatever. I can snap back at someone and I can feel satisfied in the moment, but long term. So I've had this long term, short term thing going on. But what it came down to was, am I proud of myself right now and later? Woo! So that's, I decided this morning, I'm going to shift my perspective a little bit and pay attention. First off, I give myself permission to not say anything, to not do anything give myself permission if it's unclear what is the best healthiest most balanced thing to do I give myself permission to do nothing and say nothing and that's huge right there I don't have to look good or be right I can just be quiet and then um consider what would make me proud so I'll stay tuned I'll let you know For me, sometimes the words are magical. It helps me to make it real, shift it. And just being happy and intuitive wasn't quite getting it for me. But I can relate to, did that make me feel proud of myself? Not somebody else, but me. And uh, so I'll let you know how that goes. But it sure works right in here. It's not about understanding others. It's not about mastering others. It's about that inside job. So thanks. Glad you're here. Thanks, Lori. You. Brought up something that I thought was really good. I hadn't thought of. We're told in recovery to think the drink through. Think through what's going to happen through the whole deal before you drink. To think the drink through. Maybe we can think the action through. Think the thought through, too. Think the decision through. That's what you're talking about, too. Yeah, absolutely. Not just how, what is the moment going to provide, but what, because there's all this push to be in the moment. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But I really like ice cream right now in this moment. But tomorrow, or when my body's all achy from the sugar, I'm not going to like it so much. So that's not like the magical answer, (laughs) right? So it is about thinking it through. Pause pause people oh my gosh pause 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 i would send you guys little pause buttons i make them i laminate them i leave them laying around i still have my email still pauses and my text because used to i needed that because i'd stop i'd send something i shouldn't and i'd stop it before it went (laughs) i don't need it as much anymore yeah that's good he who dies with the most toys dies And that realization of having enough only comes from within. That's an inside job like the rest of this. All of this is pointing us within, isn't it? Okay, on to the last stanza. If you stay in the center and embrace death with your whole heart, you will endure forever. Those who keep their, this is McDonald's, those who keep their course have a strong will. Those who embrace death will not perish but have everlasting life. So if you embrace death, you don't die. Is that what it's saying? To die, but not to perish is to be eternally present. That's Gafu Fang. And guys, if you're new to this and you hear us reading all these translations, there's hundreds of translations of the Tao Te Ching. And we find if we read a few different ones that sometimes it shines some light that we didn't see before. So that's the reason we approach it this way. Or one who gives himself to the Tao surely lives forever. Oscar? Yeah. I just thought all these stanzas, apart from being the the statements they make, they also have a kind of irony in it by giving us, as a reader, the choice. And actually, it's always the same choice. Either 
you go outward or you go inward. Either you lead your life through a lower self or an ego, egoic self or persona or whatever name we give it, or you lead your life by your higher self. I just thought, oh, wow, you, there's irony. Either you can do it this way, but you can also do it this way. So I like that very much. And, and here is the Jonathan Starr gives the last thansa. Uh, one who gives himself to his position surely lives long. One who gives himself to Tao surely lives forever. So there is, again, this striving, this ego striving for a high position. So you make a name and they remember your name. And maybe in 400 years, there is a street with your name on it. So you, they, yeah, surely live long. You sure can live long. But if you go inside and you reach the, or you get a feel of the unchangeable in yourself, the unchangeable timeless dimension in ourselves, that's where we live forever, I think. That's how I read it. But yeah, that's how I read things. That's good, Oscar. Thank you. My interpretation on verse 33, I think, fits with this. I normally don't read mine, but I will this one. Mastering yourself. If you know others, you have wisdom. If you know yourself, you're truly enlightened. Mastering others takes outward power. Mastering yourself takes inner surrender. Just like you were talking about, Oscar. One's in the, one's looking outside of ourselves and the other is digging deep within. He who conquers, who, he who continues to exert powerlessness over himself and others will succeed. He who surrenders to this life will never taste death. This really is about, man, turning that light around, looking within, letting go, not holding on, but letting go. Reminds me of the line from the master, from the sage. They do their work, then they let it go, and in letting it go, it makes it stay. That idea of not grasping. Actually, I met with a sponsee this morning. Have a once a quote that would fall right into that. See where was that? Uh, this is verse fifty three in the Wincea, translated by Thomas uh, Cleary. The way says. In darkness, follow the authority of nature and share the same energy with nature. You'll have no thoughts or worries. Keep no excess surplus. You do not welcome what comes, cling to what goes. Though people may be of the east, west, south, and north, you stand alone in the middle because you let go of what you can't hold on to. It's not that you let go of something you can hold on to. You're letting go of something that's not trying to get away from you. <laughs> it It's going. Okay, How much effort are you going to put forth to try to hold on to it? That's the whole problem. It's not you having a choice of whether it's letting go or it's going or not. It's going. <laughs> this idea of being in the center, that referenced it too. And this does in 33, if you stay in the center, what what? Does that resonate with you guys? There's a lot of, the Tao talks about staying in the center a lot. And recently, I heard it put that staying in the center is like a spinning wheel or like a merry-go-round, you could say. Uh, you get in the middle. Those Is that what they, out on the uh, playgrounds, the, the, would they call that a merry-go-round? Is that the right name for the, you could spin it faster and faster? Let's say you've got one of those humming. If you're in the center, you can sit there and enjoy it. The further you get to the outside, the more force there is that's working against you. Maybe this is talking about the same thing, about staying in the center. And also, before I forget, why do we read this stuff? Because it would appear that we'd be reading this to get more intellectual knowledge, right? We're saying it's not about intellectual knowledge, but here we are reading all these translations, all this stuff. I realized my purpose in reading changed. It changed from what can I learn from this to can I see their experience in this, which is much different. And I have to approach every book I read that way. If I'm looking at spiritual, it's easy 
I do it too. I, I came across a book the other day and it was like the volumes of Taoist classic, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I got to have that. I got to have that. So I bought them. What I realized though, is that even when I'm reading those things, what I'm looking for is not necessarily the words that are said, but what the words are pointing to. It's like the finger pointing at the moon. It's not the words are not the moon. They're pointing to the moon. The same way that we hear that the master is concerned with the root, not the leaves. The words are the leaves. They're not the root. We've got to get down to the root. Y'all see the difference there? Does that is it? Does that resonate at all? We we have to look. We can't. Same with meditation. We can't go into an outward act like meditation, thinking we're going to accomplish something by meditating. I'm going to meditate. I don't know whatever y'all meditate. And if I do this every day for this long, man, I'm going to get a lot further along. I'm going to maybe one day I'll get in light. All of that kind of talk. And at first, that's what I thought. Then I realized that it wasn't that way at all, that just as I read a book, just as I have a meeting like this, just as we talk, it just meditation helps me just to be more aware that there is nothing to accomplish, that I already have everything. If I'm complete, it doesn't mean that I need something else, some other part. A child at eight years old is a healthy child's complete just because that child can't drive a car or get married or go out and make a living doesn't mean he's missing something. He's missing nothing. He's an eight year old child. And I look at me, I look at me in the same way that I'm just becoming more aware and I'm right where I'm supposed to be because there's nowhere else for me to be. That's it. Staying in the center, embrace death with my whole heart. I think that goes back to the idea that we have to die to live. In Christian terms, we're crucified with Christ daily, that we have to lay down our life or lay down our fear and our selfishness and our dishonesty and resentment, pick up love in its place, allow love to be worked in our lives by us, taking actions that we don't believe will work, and then we start changing. And I, for me, that's embracing death. And when I do, I realize that there is no death and that when I physically pass, where will I be? Wherever I was before I was born. There's nothing for me to figure out. In other words, I don't spend a lot of time speculating anymore. I would rather talk about what's going on in this moment, things that help me stay in this moment, which are how to walk in love, how to walk in compassion, how to enter meetings like this instead of, oh, how can I make myself sound spiritual to, what does Oscar and Brian and Paul and Laura and Scotty need today? How can I help them today? That's all you have to do is just open your heart. Listen, do what Laurie said, pause and wait till you see the right place to go. The Tao talks about standing on what is already moving. I can't see what's moving if I'm all in my head, already have everything figured out. I don't know how many times a day I'm working on something and I say, I'm powerless over whatever this is. I do not know the best solution. Just sit with it for a minute. Maybe not then, sometime later in the day. Sometimes when I meditate, a lot of times when I'm meditating, an idea will pop in my head, a solution. I'm like, oh, that's how to do that. And I'll stop and I'll put it in my, I'll make a note of it so I don't forget it. Then I go back to meditating. I asked Sensei one time if that was okay. He said, oh yeah, he says, I keep a notepad by me when I meditate. I said, okay. I hear some people say, don't do that, but it works for me. It just becomes simpler, doesn't it? If it's not becoming simpler, it's probably in my head. Probably in my head. Yeah, that's good. Any other comments, guys? We still have a minute. Do y'all have anything? Seems I talked way too much today, as usual. I just got a little thing here. I'm really glad you mentioned the embracing death part there, buddy. Last few years have been pretty rough. I've lost a lot of friends and family members. And in fact, this afternoon, a bunch of us are getting online. We all had a mutual friend who passed away very suddenly uh, before Christmas of a massive heart attack at the age of 58. No, no health issues prior to that just really came out of the blue. And I'm really glad that a couple of his friends reached out to me and said, do you think we should do something? And I said, 
yeah, let's, let's all get together and run all from different parts of the country. So we're going to do a, we're going to do a video meeting uh, this afternoon and we're just going to share stories and just help each other out. And uh, yeah, I really hit home because he's just a few months older than I am. And uh, I really have been, had a hard time processing this one because like I said, it just came out of the blue and you just never know. And that's where you have to live in the moment. And, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to try to use the, the principles of the Tao and just, just be there for, we can all be there for each other this afternoon and just, just let people talk and see where it goes. I, I don't know what to expect. I expect I'm going to hear a lot of stories. I didn't know because I didn't know him. I, I knew him in a professional capacity more than a personal one. So maybe I'm going to hear some good personal stuff today, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to this in the past. This is probably something I would have drank over. I said, oh, I'm not, I can't handle that. I'm just going to check out of that. But I'm actually looking forward to this because it's going to be tough, but it's going to be, I think it's going to be very, very enlightening and it's going to be, it's going to be very cathartic. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm glad I decided to hop on this one today because I needed to hear this stuff this morning. Thank you guys. Thank you, Paul. D death always reminds, if you're dealing with a death, reminds me of verse 50. I'm going to read it right quick out of Stephen Mitchell. The master gives himself up to whatever the moment brings. He knows that he's going to die and he has nothing left to hold on to. No illusions of the mind, what we're talking about this morning. No resistances in his body. He doesn't think about his actions. They flow from the core of his being. He holds nothing back from life. Therefore, he's ready for death as a man is ready for sleep after a good day's work. Holds nothing back. And that whole thing starts with giving himself up to whatever the moment brings, which in some of our thinking, that would be the Tao. That would be God, the moment, the eternal present, that eternal moment. Because when you think about it, if God is love, a verb, the only time you can love is when? Right now in this moment. It's the only time. So the point of the whole deal is to get us to this moment. Yeah. Holds nothing back. That's good. Thank you, Paul. Brian? Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking about several months ago. I really started asking myself professionally, like, what in the hell am I doing? And why in the hell am I doing it? Trying to find that answer and to be and, and to let go and just be content. And one of the things that, that I've considered doing is, is selling my business and maybe taking a year and just figuring out what the hell I want to do. And I'm not made of money, but I'm in a place where I could do that. And, and so saying that, dude, this week, I've been, we, we've been closed all week because of the weather. And, and I've done a few things from home, but yesterday I knocked off, I guess it was maybe about one o'clock or so. And I said, I'm going to work on my gratitude list. And, and man, I, I sat there for a couple hours and I was just doing some of my readings and I realized that I wasn't scrambling for a BC or because I got a migraine, my jaw wasn't killing me. And, and, and I was just really reflecting on, I was like, if I continue, not, and I'm not saying I'm planning on going anywhere, but if, if I was to check out today, I would leave a hell of a mess for my wife to fix. And I say mess, selling equipment, property, d different things. And, and I, I don't know. I just, I'm really let it settle. I've really talked to my sponsor about it that I'm going to give it a year or two surrender into this and maybe the right thing will happen the the right thing will happen and and it's not it's not filing bankruptcy and sh shutting everything down but it the, the the right person will come into my path and so i really feel like i've got some peace around it got some peace around it matter of fact when we started having that rain I was driving to work and by myself 
I'm the only person in my damn building. Two of my tenants are not there because they've got sense. And, and so employees are not there. I'm there by myself. And it just hit me. It was like, Brian, you got to let go of this. Go home, tie up your loose ends from home. And, and hell, I almost didn't get home. I got a four wheel drive truck and I had to drive 10 miles an hour all the way home. But I was just like, I had plenty of time to think because I live about 20 miles away. Man, I need this stuff. I feel like it's slowly soaking in and I'm getting my answers if I'm just willing to freaking listen and open my eyes to what's in front of me. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I think we all go back and forth with it. None of us do this perfectly. (laughs) We all bounce around here. And that's the nature of learning this way of life. Because we have these challenges that come at us. And if we're not careful, we'll take those and we'll hold on to them and run in that direction for a while. Then we'll come back. And then other things we'll handle well. So it's a growing up. It's an awareness process, a growing up process, Brian, is all it is. Growing up. Yeah. And if I'm 48, I'm still growing. (laughs) Add 10 years to that, my friend. I think you (laughs) Hey, if you go up, I'm, I'm not on, I hope I'm not on that heart attack list this year, Paul, because I'm in the 58s too. I just have to sit with what is this moment. If it starts squirreling my head away, what I can do is I can say, okay, this happens sometimes. I have air to breathe. They're not cutting off the power today. They're not repoing anything today. I have friends who love me. I have family who loves me. All that gratitude stuff, Paul. I start pulling all that, pull that. And before I know it, I realize everything is okay. And the only place it's not is in my head. Brian? I think I've shared before about the guy that, that sends his gratitude list to me. Uh, long story short, this guy started sending it. I'm, I'm on a WhatsApp group with several hundred people. And this guy picked me and five or six other people. He sends just an amazing gratitude list every day. And at first I was like, who in the hell is this guy? This guy's in Baltimore, Maryland. I had nothing in common with this dude. And, and it, it made me feel a little weird, but I started reading it and man, this guy has some unbelievable gratitude. And I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times and a super nice guy, early seventies, but he's had some terrible consequences because of his addiction. And, and it's like you hear something like that and you're like, holy shit. I, yeah, yeah, let me add that to my gratitude list. And I really feel like that there's more to than this guy just showing up on my WhatsApp. It's what I've needed. What I've needed. It's, I get up in the morning and I'm like, holy cow. I'm thankful I don't have to take a bus, a city bus to a doctor and make two or three changes. I've got a warm truck I can get in and go wherever I want. So it's one of those things that one of those hits up upside the head that I needed. We can't hear those, Brian, if we're just all stuck in ourselves trying to figure out how to fix my problem. That's part of that surrender. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good comments today, guys. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Anything else? All minds clear or relatively clear? Y'all have a great week. Hope to see you guys next week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.